I am thrilled to welcome to the stage, come on Ira, Ira Rubenstein, and you promised me one of those buttons. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> um, Ira is it's Chief good. Digital Officer and um, Chief, Chief Digital and Marketing Officer at PBS. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be talking to him. Hang on, I gotta put, I gotta put, here, hold that. I gotta put my button on. Because I am a PBS super fan. Um, they say that out of the 200 and whatever, 56 channels on television, people pretty much watch, what, seven? I flip between E and PBS. Those are my, my two mainstays. I don't know what that says about me, but my first major television memory is watching Poldark, not the one that's on right now, the original one in 1976 um, with my mother. And that really kicked off my love of PBS. And then, of course, when they did the reboot, um, started two years ago, I think you're in season right. three. Um, my daughter was the same age as I was when I watched it with my mom. I did not have the same success with getting her <laughs> engaged with, with it, although we did watch Anne of Green Gables together um, when you guys ran that. So I will stop nattering on about my love of PBS um, and let's talk about what you've been doing at PBS because you've been at PBS now for about four years. Yep. Um, and PBS is just, it's such a stalwart, um, trusted brand. Um, and it's a little bit, if I were to describe it, it's a little bit like a beautiful English manor house that's probably a little bit dusty, that probably needs some major plumbing um, rework, you know, and you can't really see it, but you know it's there, and you know it needs to be modernized. And talk to us a little bit about when you came to PBS. I don't know if that was what you found, but I will say that as a as a devoted viewer, and I watch it online as well, I did notice the transition um, when, and that was, <laughs> I didn't know it was you, um, <laughs> when the, the online experience just became crisper and yeah. modern and cleaner, and you were able to do it in a way that I really think stayed true to the brand, but it was, you know, it was visibly noticeable to me, and I, and I really liked where you took it. So I'd love to hear kind of what was it like when you came in, how did you know what to do? <laughs> and how did you get it done? So um, um, we are, a, was known as a legacy brand. And um, we are, you know, survey after survey, we're the most trusted media brand by far. Yeah. Um, and most trusted, you know, institution by far. And I'm sorry, I don't remember all the stats top of my head. Um, but um, it's, it's a little intimidating uh, being involved in that because I feel personal pressure not to mess it up. Right. And it also drives, you know, listening, um, talking before about, you know, my reasoning for going um, was it was a move to Arlington from LA. And um, I, I felt like I had to give back. And I felt like um, if I didn't do this, I didn't know who would move to Arlington in digital media and you know, make sure that this institution survives this, right. what's going on. And so when I got there, what I found was they had done a lot of things right. They had gotten out early into streaming and they had a Roku app, um, and, but it was just a really poor consumer experience. Yeah. Um, and what Although I, I did, could get all my videos for free. When you came on, you started locking them. Oh, no, so well, I'll get to Passport. <laughs> yeah, you'll get to that, sorry. Um, but what I did first and foremost was I laid out a digital strategy for the system. And it was, uh, we were gonna take consumers first. And um, I know that sounds common today, but four or five years ago was kind of a change of attitude. Consumers first, second, focus on the local station. And I, I say that because the way the PBS model works is we're a system of 350 local stations throughout the country. And each one is individually owned, operated. Some are state networks, some are universities, some are private. And the system works as a whole because of viewers supporting their local station who pay dues to PBS. So in the digital disruption era, if I didn't have the stations coming along on the digital content, the whole model falls apart. Right. So focusing on the stations, and third, the revenue, of course, um, which is difficult in a nonprofit environment for someone to actually think about 
revenue. Right. And what and we coming from Sony, Sony, and Fox, and you, Fox and I mean, Marvel, especially. Yeah, not that revenue <laughs> isn't the end goal. It's not necessarily woven into everything you're doing. Yeah, it's uh, what's interesting coming from the for-profit world. It's actually a little bit easier. You prioritize based on what you think is going to make the most amount of money. At PBS, we prioritize on the mission. What's going to be the most beneficial for the public, for the community, for the people we're serving? And um, you know, I don't think anyone who was thinking of you know serving kids would launch a over-the-air, 24-hour, seven-day-a-week kids channel in today's environment. Why would you do that? Well, we did that because, believe it or not, you know, one in five people in America don't have broadband. You have underserved kids who don't have access to that cable box because the second TV isn't hooked up, and they're not being served in the evening. So launching this, uh, the kids' channel over the air and online and streaming served both uh, underserved as well as um, people who have the means to reach on digital platforms. But getting back to the revenue and talking about the other things we did, um, I was also part of the launch of what's called PBS Passport. And when you mentioned, like, well, now you got to pay. It's not now you got to pay. We have thousands and thousands of hours of content for free. That's our mission. You do. You do. And you can. I just can't get season. I just can't get episode one of the Durrells in Corf Corfu right now. Yes. Well, no, actually, I did just pay. So I'm hoping I can <laughs> but get back to that. The, the idea was, in the world transforming to digital, how do we help the system change from a traditional on-air pledge model, and you all know that. It's like, we need your support. Watch this show, and they're interrupting. And you know, no one in America who has any digital access is going to sit through a pledge show today. Um, but you move that to a digital platform, and by making Passport available, so if you're a member of your station, if you support your station at the bare minimum, um, which can be as little as you know, five bucks a month, then you get access to a library of content. So Downton Abbey, big show a few years ago. You want to see all of it? Great. If you're a member, you can see it. But Poldark, this week, you can go and see that for free right now. Yeah. And, it's, and we also we make a differentiation between some of our content. So our, our news and uh, um, you know, public service, like Frontline, all of Frontline is available for free. And if you haven't seen it, I'm going to pimp one show. The Facebook Dilemma that just came out uh, is an excellent two-part episode. And if you have, weren't scared about Facebook before, you'll be terrified after seeing this. OK, that's a good one. Yeah, we were t I was talking about that one with someone last night. Um, talk to me about how, how receptive were um, users to Passport? Because I mean, these are people who are probably playing for Netflix. They're probably paying for Hulu there shouldn't be a second thought, really, about subscribing or paying for PBS programming. Um, well, again, it's, it's, it is, we are not selling a subscription service. We do not market it as a subscription no. service. It is a truly a member benefit. And so um, for the general consumers, I think people understand and have come to understand that we're still getting a lot of great content for free. But you know, to see something from the past, it's similar to you know, the old DVD pledge shows. It's like, you know, you want to see Downton Abbey, well, here's the DVD beautiful box, and right. if you're a supporter, right. $100, right. you get, you get the book it. too. Yeah. It's no different, did it's just you, in a digital platform. Did you see, though, a surge in membership with, with Absolutely. the launch of Passport? So uh, with Passport, we're now at about 1.8 million activations. It's done on an individual station-by-station -station model, so when you, do, when you make that donation, you're actually uh, the relationship is with the consumer and that local station, which is incredibly difficult technology challenging wise, but um, was the way we had to do it as a system. And um, we know that of that, 70% are brand new supporters to stations. And we also know that on average, they're about 20 years younger than your traditional uh, pledge donor. Right. So we are reaching that digital audience. And I think people, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's a no-brainer, but they, you know, believe in the mission, too, and they understand that for their local station to provide the services, they need to support them. So what was the process like with getting 
everybody on board with this digital transformation when you have 350 stations. It's a little bit, you know, they're a little bit like franchisees. You, you, know, you want everybody to um, be there was two challenges. along with you. Um, one, from a technology standpoint, it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever built, and I've built, you know, digital comics and movie download services and all sorts of things. This, because it was decentralized with individual CRMs, was technology very hard. The challenge for the system um, as a whole was to get everyone to, but one, believe that this would work, and two, mass, um, manage their own resources internally to launch, because there was work that had to be done at each individual station in order to tie into the system. So that was some of the hardest parts, and then a lot of governance was a little bit of a hard part. There was um, some nervousness about calling it PBS Passport. Um, and originally we didn't. It was always a station name. Um, but most recently, um, the system is starting to have a better understanding of what a national branding and a national campaign of pushing out our apps and our services can mean at a local level. Right. But there's always this a little bit of tension between a national and local level in the nonprofit PBS NPR world. So with the additional, I think you said 1.3 million viewers. 1.7. 1.7, sorry, <laughs> um, that came on with, with the launch of Passport. How are you um, marketing to them in a direct way? Because now you've got, I mean, that, I think that is the beautiful thing about PBS as a brand. You do have this one-to-one -one relationship with your consumers. And right. your viewers, they are very passionate about your content. It really does, I mean, you know, speaking from experience, it, it, it just incites a certain passion. But do you, are you able to market to them in a way that enhances that one-on-one -on -one relationship? So, um, or are there some guardrails in place? There's some guardrails kinda... in place. The stations as individuals have the data. They might not have the capability to leverage that data in a targeted email way. Um, but they do have the data and some have those capabilities and some don't. We have a best of PBS email that goes out. Um, and on that email, it is um, localized. So if you're from San Francisco? Los Angeles. Los Angeles, so PBS SoCal. Yep. Um, when you get the email, it'll say PBS SoCal. If you're in San Francisco, it'll say KQED at the top. And so it's, it comes from your local station. And then on top of that, we've built some technology and it's expanding of what we have on .org today where the station can actually insert their own message into that email and the station can actually insert their own message on pbs.org, which also localizes to their station. And what the stations are seeing, the ones who are actively taking advantage of those tools, it's a, it's a great source for them to raise money and a great source for them to drive video right. viewership. Right, so as... So it's more of me providing tools and services yeah. for the local stations to activate, and then we do national campaigns on some of our bigger priority projects. Right, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, when you came on board, did you consider, you know, when you look at the success of Netflix or Hulu and how um, users have responded so vigorously to subscription-based viewing, was that something that you considered when you first started mapping out what you, how you would like to modernize PBS from a digital standpoint? Was that ever on the table? No, I think, I think, you know, what I look at when I look at those services is um, I look at the consumer experience and I look at what consumers are, are starting to expect more and more. So, you know, I'll give you one example. Netflix rolled out um, offline viewing, right? And so they roll that out. I look at that. I go, that's interesting. Okay, I have limited resources. I'm going to wait to build it um, because I can't jump in in case it isn't become a thing. And then what happens in you know, a connected universe, you might not need it, but you know, time has moved on. It is a thing. We're building it. And um, probably gonna you know, add it as an extra benefit to being a member of Passport. Right, right. So you can still view everything for free, but if you're a member, now you can have offline viewing. Yeah. So I think it's those sort of little tweaks 
that we can help to encourage people to support, but still be core to our mission and make sure that the content reaches everyone no matter what your economic condition is. I think PBS always used to hold a very kind of significant niche in the quality of the content that it brings to its viewers, and it still does. That said, you know, you do see Netflix starting to bring in more of that programming with The Crown. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of, I always felt The Crown should have been on PBS. Not that I didn't love it on Netflix, but um, I, I never really felt that PBS had a lot of competition. Do you feel that that is increasing as these new outlets um, are able to bring more of that type of viewing to, you know, to their viewers? Um. Uh, yes and no. I mean, the crown's interesting. So to give you perspective, what Netflix will spend on one season of the crown is our entire content budget for wow. the year. Um, so, um, so you weren't getting that one. We're, we, we can't compete like that. Yeah. And what it also means is we're often doing partnerships. So we're partnering with ITV or BBC and they'll have the international rights. And so we're very focused on just domestic. Um, you know, in that drama category, there's definitely a lot of competition. Um, but that's not who we are. And I, I quote our CEO, Paula, you know, she mentions all the time, if we were interested in ratings solely, we'd be British drama seven days a week. But that's not what we're about. Right. We're about the uh, diverse education um, platform or content. And so Nature, Nova, Frontline, independent films, documentaries, um, news, et cetera. Um, and so in that category, I still think we um, differentiate. And I think we still um, rise above. There, you know, over the years, there have been a few cable companies uh, or networks that have come after these niche. Right, like Net, Net Geo, I think, has been. Exactly. But if you look at what their content has gone to, it's all gone to the lowest common denominator of reality TV because they couldn't make the business model work. Right. And in our case, we don't have that advertiser business model where viewers supported. Right. And the viewers do respond enough uh, to support that content. Right, well, and hopefully I would think PBS probably benefits from all of the viewers that came into The Crown because now you know, they know they can find similar content on PBS, so. You mean like Downton Abbey or? Yeah, well, you know, I, I just, I think for somebody watching The Crown, it may make them interested in Victoria. Wanting to, oh, yeah, so yes. potentially PBS can benefit from the users that they're bringing in to that type of high quality content. Yeah, the, the real challenge today is, you know, making sure that people are aware of your content. There's so much out there and we do not have the marketing budgets that everyone else has. Right. And um, we just have to be very smart and strategic and placing our bets on the properties that we think can reach people. But at the same time, we do a lot of things for mission. And I'll give an example. Um, uh, the Great American Read uh, that just concluded uh, was about uh, America's love of books and counting down the favorite or most loved book, uh, Kill a Mockingbird, if you missed it. Um, and um, you know, you think about something like that, and there's not many networks who would do a show about books. Right. And uh, even Jimmy Kimmel did something funny about, you know, people not reading. But that's the whole point. Because we did this program, stations did, we did online book clubs, they did local book clubs, there was events at libraries, at schools, and it was across generation, young to old. And it was getting people to read again. And that's right into our mission. Right. So how do you go from doing marketing at Sony, where you probably had $50 million to market a film, depending on the film, to PBS, where you don't, you don't have those kind of budgets. Yeah. Um, you know, and I know you said it's a challenge, but how, how do you go from, you know, maybe it's 50 million to 500,000, where you're really trying to make every, every penny work? Was that, was that so challenging for you? It, it's, it is challenging, but it's, what's interest, what I find interesting, coming from you know, Hollywood, I have less cooks in the kitchen when it comes right. to my marketing budgets right. and approvals and things like that. Um, and uh, so that's, I like a lot. Um, but we have to be, again, opportunistic and strategic. And so I'll give you an example. We had um, a film, 
a nature series called Spy in the Wild. And they were little robotic animals that had cameras, tiny cameras, and they were up close to the animals. Well, that made great video for the internet. And so what we did was we took very short clips, we made the content for the platform, for you know, digital platforms, for mobile phones, and then we did a completely 100% digital buy. And there's no, no one in Hollywood would ever do 100% digital right. buy. And that's what we did, and it became the highest natured show in the last 10 years. A very small buy, but yeah. it was because we took advantage of the content and we could create the right material to meet that content. Yeah, no, that's great to hear, because I think one of the questions that we're trying to answer today and in the next panel, you know, when you talk about the big idea, it always seems to need a lot of money behind it. And I don't think a big idea in marketing necessarily has to have a lot of money. Some of it is how grassroots can you make it and can you get people to start, you know, sharing and really have a passion for whatever it is that you're, that you're marketing. And, and I know one of the questions always is, can you make impact as a brand with 100% digital campaign and yeah I, I give you another example of um, the I love PBS campaign so um, when the current administration came into power there was um, a lot of talk about defunding of public media and um, what I had noticed was I, I wear this button to lots of conferences and people you know, like oh can I have, you know I love PBS and so I always, if you want your button I have the IRA, he's got a pocket um, full but I was, so I thought how can I do that digitally how can I take advantage of that love and power to spread that message? And so we made a little Facebook uh, profile frame uh, for yeah, I Love I PBS. And you know, it went out to, to oh, 20, 30 million people, spent a tiny bit of money, yeah. but it was that viral push and then encouraging people to reach out to their local congressmen and senators um, where, again, I will mention, we do have broad support on both sides of the aisle uh, in Congress. Um, and that's helpful. Um, but it's again taking advantage of the material, taking advantage of the consumer's feelings, and then laying in the power of digital on that to amplify that. And it doesn't always take a lot of money. Having a lot of money is absolutely helpful, nice. makes it easier. Not having makes you have to be a little bit more uh, resourceful. Yeah, a little smarter. Um, I loved what you said in the beginning when we first started talking. You know, you said you start with the consumer. And, you know, I. That seems like a no-brainer. We all know you need to start with the consumer, but I've certainly seen many campaigns come to fruition where we really don't start with the consumer. And I think you have to because it is such a beloved brand. Um, you also oversee the business intelligence group yep. at PBS. Um, I'd love to hear a little more about how you go about, you know, connecting with understanding your consumer um, and, and what it is that they, they're looking for. I mean, do you have loads of information on them um, where you can really dissect who they are and, and what they're looking for? What does business intelligence entail at PBS? So um, about a year and a half ago, we brought together our digital analytics team and our Nielsen's team, your traditional TV, and neither understood each other's worlds. And with the way of convergence, that had to happen. And so we're right now, I would say it's still a very much a work in progress. I don't think there's any media companies or traditional media companies out there who have quite figured it out. Um, there's lots of tools, there's lots of companies that are pitching different tools. Um, but to have that complete picture, it's still not quite there. You have that Nielsen number, which again, we have a core group of people that really do watch over the air. That's a big, big number. But I have this rising group. And then I have a whole separate group of kids, two to eight, who are really mostly digital, yeah. um, except for the underserved kids. So it's different habits by different age groups. So you can't just look at it across the board. You actually are looking by your different age groups. So when I have a, a project, um, uh, let me pick one. I'll pick one coming up. So country music, Ken Burns, a year from now, eight nights history country music, um, like he did jazz. Um, so it's, all right, I'm gonna go after country music fans, and I know I can get those people, but how do I get my older audience who might not be country music fans, but are Ken fans? And so I know about those sort of people, right. and I know I can, I can reach those people through ways I've reached before. Right. So it's kind of, kind of targeting like that, and then 
On the digital platforms, it'll be, okay, what kind of content can I get that's gonna, where I get the rights, because music's expensive, and I can, uh, you know, generate curiosity about, I'm gonna check this out. Where does first party data fit in to your marketing plans? Does PBS have a DMP? Um, how, are you, are you moving them more in that direction? I know it's always difficult for networks in general to have first party data. So, I mean, the first party data we have is on our platforms. Yep. And so, um, um, but it's in an aggregate form because of the relationships with the station. Yeah. So, it's, so it's a little, a little tricky bit to unlock. You know, it's almost like you know it's there and you just can't. You right. get to it. And it to I would say that as a system, the system is beginning to understand that we're stronger together if we can aggregate our data to uh, benefit all. Yeah. What pressures do you feel as a marketer? I, you know, I, I work with um, other networks. We, we work with the Disney group of networks, so I certainly know the pressures that ABC is under. I know the pressure that Disney Kids is under with so much of kids viewing migrating um, to digital. Um, you don't have the advertiser pressures that they do, but it's, you know, it really is a whole new game suddenly for broadcast marketers. And I know that you know, the entire industry is really a bit in a quandary as to what comes next. Um, right. And where does, you know, we know that everyone's mig you know, slowly migrating over to digital, but what does that mean for a network in the modern age? Is, is PBS under those same pressures? Um, what, I think our pressures are different. I, I think our pressures are really how do I bring local stations along? And I use smaller stations like uh, I, I always use El Paso as my poster child, Emily, the general manager there. There's nine total people in that station, nine. And so there's no chance they're going to have any sort of digital anything. Right. And so we build platforms for them so we have a, CR, a CMS so they can build a website. And it, you know, anyone can do it, it's drag, drop. And then we build these uh, sort of modules that will update it automatically for them so they can focus on content and things for them. So the pressures I think I see and I feel are really how I bring all stations, big and small, into this digital era. How do we transform PBS to this new business while still maintaining our core business? If you look at Disney, for example, so Disney made a strategic decision. They took all their content off Netflix, cost them hundreds of millions of dollars, right? But they were, they're making that shift. Right. And they're, they bought BAM Tech. They're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in that technology. So we barely have enough to maintain TV. So we have to find additional funds somewhere to really lean in or, you know, say, build out this digital platform for the future. And um, I have lots of different companies come to me and they show me the different you know, off-the-shelf solutions. But the challenge is, is immediately when I start talking about localization, local station donation tracks to a separate CRM, their eyes roll over and they go, oh yeah, that's gonna cost millions of dollars. And it's like, well, I'm already in that game. So, so what that's are your, the challenge. So what, um, what goals are you typically chasing when you're launching a big new show? So when the Ken Burns country series comes on air next year, is it really, is, is there an end goal of subscriptions as opposed to oh, no, are ratings the, less the, important and it's more about we need to bring in X number of subscribers? So we really measure engagement. So engagement is measured by both views on air and online, but also by local community events. So I'll give you an example um, of the last Ken Burns. So Vietnam War, um, 10 part, um, I think it was eight. Um, series on the Vietnam War. And the important thing about that film, it took them 10 years to make, and it was really about driving the conversation about the Vietnam War that never took place in America, ever. And so local stations had um, veteran events, they had talks, they had Ken come out, and it was those sort of community efforts that to us is the home run. Yeah. And getting communities to talk about it. And then we had online feedback and people sharing their own stories. And if you, it's still up, you can read through them. And it just, you know, makes me feel great when I see stories about people saying, I finally got to talk to my father about Vietnam. Never, yeah. never got to talk to him about, yeah. or my brother. And it was like, because people came back and they never talked about it. And so it's like stuff like that, that that's, 
way more important yeah. than what's your rating. Yeah. So when you're putting together, you know, when you're looking at marketing, I, I, I understand you have the, you know, you're responsible for the national level and then the stations are doing their own, but are you also working hand in hand, like for that idea of, you know, bringing vets together and starting that conversation? Is that something that came from PBS? Was it a brainstorm with the other stations? And then how do you go about getting all the stations on board with that? Was that something that caught fire across the entire <laughs> network? So, um, when we have a, a big event, we have uh, groups that are called station services. And it depends on the project, because um, like a, uh, a show that might come out of WGBH in Boston or WNET, they have uh, a group there. It's a little bit partnership in, in that way. So um, we will then hold webinars and constantly you know, pitching to stations, here are ideas giving them tools, giving them turnkey kits, giving them digital elements that they can localize, et cetera. But it's, again, because the stations are bigger or small, really focusing on one key event uh, per quarter is how we kind of uh, you know, manage that. Um, I wanna give the audience a chance to ask you some questions, but I do wanna ask you just, what are you most excited about when you think about the future of PBS and your, and your role in it? What, what gets you, what, what gets your juices flowing? Have you, have you kind of done all the work you want to do? Have you laid, or is it more I've laid the groundwork and now we're gonna oh, gosh. Um, ratchet well, it up? Coming in a, in a, oh, I probably can't say that. <laughs> I put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I'll get in trouble. Um, all right, there's something big coming to PBS <laughs> next year. Um, I will say I am working on a brand refresh for PBS, and the last time that the PBS brand was uh, kind of freshened was before the era of mobile phones. So we needed to make sure that our logo and brand works on the small screen as well as the big screen. Yeah. I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm speaking, also, let me just ask you, speaking of a brand refresh, are you allowed to, is part of your purview, can you, can you affect that on air? Because so much of, I think PBS's marketing machine is your own on-air channel. So yes. will that extent, you're allowed it, to... It will go on there, and then this is where we get into partnerships with local stations, and a lot of them have changed their names. So you have Rocky Mountain PBS or you know, Great Lakes, or, and so it's, we have to work with them and how that brand will work with their brand um, in a local level. And then it gets even more complicated because some stations have also NPR, and they're what's a joint license or, and we're two separate companies. Mm -hmm. So then how do they signify right. both? I would say the other thing I'm really excited about and I believe is the big upside is I truly believe in digital fundraising, we have the opportunity to raise a lot more money. Yeah, I think so. I, I just think that it really is gonna be so much simpler. We're working on uh, what I call one-click donation. So today, at the end of a video on, a, on your web browser, you'll get a donate button. That donate button goes directly to whatever station you're localized. That has become the number one place where people donate on PBS.org, more than the top permanent nav, which I thought was remarkable. Yeah. So after seeing that, we're starting to build out what I call one-click donation. So imagine you're watching on Amazon Fire, right? right? And you just got done watching for free Frontline's Facebook. And then you get a message, hey, support Frontline and your local station, click here. I want to build that so that you can say yes, it charges your Amazon wallet, the money goes directly to K yeah, PBS SoCal, and I believe that, once it launches, I believe will more than triple our donation flow. Yeah, yeah, even if it's just donate $5. All right, yeah, making it easy. People would do, I love that. So any um, questions for Ira while we have him here? Looking out in the audience. Yes, Bettina. Thank you, Bettina. You got, a, you got a microphone. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, what was the hardest transition going from corporate, studio, Marvel, to a uh, nonprofit? Like, personal and professional, what was the hardest challenges? What were the hardest challenges? Um, I think the hardest, I think I mentioned a little bit, the hardest part for me was prioritization. In, in the for-profit, especially at Marvel, Whatever made the most amount of money, that's what we did. And in PBS, the nonprofit, there's so many good causes. 
And you know, what do you prioritize and what do you do? And I'll go back to that, that kids channel. You know, it costs a few million bucks to spin that thing up. And it was a big effort for us. And you, you go, is that really gonna make the impact that you think it is? And we looked at the data and we looked at especially underserved kids at five, six, seven o'clock at night not having quality educational TV, their parents might be working a second job, that we could have an impact there. And that's what happened. And that, you know, is one of the most rewarding things I think I've ever done. And uh, I've mentioned this before. We actually, you might see it on air. We have a, a voicemail that came in from a grandmother in Mississippi, and she just wanted to thank whoever thought of this, mm. because she said it, it's changed her life. Wow. She has quality TV for her kids. Wow. And, you know, you saved a life here, and you just, you hear this spot, and we made a, a thing for TV, and it's just like, you know, it makes you feel good. Yeah, it's better than a big box and office. you know, you weekend. talk about, you know, the transition, and, you know, that's the hardest part, but it's also the most rewarding part. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of, you know, I like to say 99% of the things I'm working on and shows at PBS, and not 1% when I was at a studio. <laughs> All right, well, look for um, the Ken Burns. I have a question here. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Right here. Uh, Ira? Wait, where are I'll you? Stand, I'll stand okay, up. There you go, stand. Oh, uh, so do you ever have a situation where you really want to build content and it's for the right thing, but the viewership or the funding is just not there, but you continue to do it because you feel it's the right thing to do? Or at nonprofits, there, where is that line between feeling good about the content and then trying to find viewership or some funding for it that may not be there? Um, well, I, I'm, not in, I'm not responsible for the TV content. We do have a, a whole digital channel, PBS Digital Studios, um, which is you know, more targeted towards uh, a younger YouTube generation. And um, what I like to think of is figuring, 50 years ago, PBS figured out what does quality educational TV mean in this vast wasteland of TV. Well, if any of you have any children, you look at YouTube, it's a vast wasteland. And um, so the content we make there, I'm, I do look at the numbers there, I do look at the interactions and the comments, and, um, and that's, we, we have to make those kind of choices on that platform. I would say on TV, um, we're still core to the mission, and if you, you know, if you go by ratings or streams alone, Arts and entertainment just doesn't drive a lot. I know that's shocking. But um, you know, our biggest, biggest arts and entertainment thing we did most recently was ha the making of Hamilton. So I mean, we, yeah, we got lucky, we had I Hamilton. But you know, when you talk to Lynn, he'll talk about his exposure to the arts was on PBS. And if we're not doing that, how are we helping to create the next generation of Lynn Manuel's? And so it's important to do. And, um, and that's why, you know, going back to, we're not drama all the time. We have to be diverse. We have to present it all. And uh, through our economic model, we can. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ira. Thanks. I really enjoyed chatting with you. <laughs> and get your I Love PBS button from Ira. All right, we'll be right back with our next panel. So just give us a few minutes.